Thanks to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. The year is 1955, and the fastest fighter jet in the world is an American. And it's not Soviet, it's Australian. Roaring through the skies, much like the sound of a didgeridoo, this Delta Wing fuel-burning monster is able to see in the dark with advanced radar, fly at Mach 1.5 for an extensive range, and blow anything out of the sky with its four machine guns. But this reality never happened. The most ambitious aerospace project of Australia would only be betrayed by the very empire it was designed to protect leading not only to copycat productions by rival builders, but even leaking the plans to the Soviets. As an Australian, this is a very painful story for me to tell, but I'm super excited to bring you one of history's best forgotten projects. This is the ever-built Commonwealth CA-23, or as I like to call it, the Aussie Whale Shark Jet Fighter. The Australian Air Force in 1948, at the end of World War II era, still mainly consisted of piston propeller aircraft like Mustangs and early jets like the Gloucester Meteor and Vampire. Australia desperately needed to modernise to remain relevant in the region, and they needed a new fighter jet. The issue was, the latest British or American designs were at least 10 years away from landing on Oceania shores, and the Aussies needed this new fighter jet yesterday. So as they sat there swatting away flies from their tinnies, they wondered, why did they have to buy a foreign one? There was one thing the Aussies had in spades, an extensive aircraft design department with a solid track record and a budget to match. So why not build this next generation aircraft themselves down under? The Australian government Commonwealth requirements were broad, but simple. The aircraft will need to be a two-seater, have a radar, be able to fly in all sorts of weather, and fly faster than Mark 1, with twin engines. Back then, jet engines were a brave new frontier, and it was believed that redundancy was key in all aircraft systems, especially if you consider how fast and how high this jet was supposed to go. Hence, two pilots and two engines. The plane would also need to have a large range, being able to fly between Australian cities at a moment's notice, something that was more preferred in American jets at the time rather than British aircraft. So that's where they decided to start. The first proposal looked like the Grumham XF9F2 Panther. It had straight wings, a single engine, and a large nose to house the radar. Hilariously, the plan actually was to buy a Panther from the US Navy for £40,000 and use it as the template. Not surprisingly, the US government turned to them and said heck no. The Panther was still a highly secret project and months away from development. Thus, the second homegrown proposal was developed. It would have two engines in the rear and have the pilots in tandem with a thin 40 degree swept wing. Being approved, the Australian government gave £45,000 to the Commonwealth Aircraft Corporation for two prototypes. And now, side note, these initial designs were actually published in a Melbourne newspaper by the end of 1948, much to the surprise of the Australian government. A full investigation launched, but they couldn't plug that leak. This would only foreshadow one of the main issues with the project. As the proposal was developed, the final design is what really made Australia look to the world and say, you call that a knife? This is a knife. This Australian aircraft design was so cutting edge that it put the Aussies on the map, just like you could be in your own life with a Squarespace website. But hold on, don't skip this part as I'll have some sneak peeks for future videos. But just like the Australians, Squarespace has something new called the Fluid Engine. It pretty much means you start in best-in-class website templates and then customize every design detail with a reimagined drag-and-drop technology for both desktop and mobile, so you don't have to make two separate websites. Stretch your imagination online with this Fluid Engine built in and ready to go with any new Squarespace site. Plus, that's not all. Every Squarespace website can have a built-in shop to start selling right away, or you can use the campaign market marketing tools to start driving business instantly. Seriously, Squarespace is the secret weapon that even I use for my online store, foundandexplain.shop, so thanks Squarespace. If you want to support the channel and see more videos just like this, and get 10% off your first site and domain, go to www.squarespace.com found. 
I'm excited for your success and a special warm hug to all those that click the link helping making videos just like this. Called the CA-23, this new all-weather jet would be a Delta Wing aircraft, a fancy new aircraft fuselage that massively increased speed and maneuverability. It would have a low set tail and an extensive range to be able to defend much of the Australian coastline. And now let's talk about its Whale Shark jet intake. Thanks to its twin jet engines, specifically the mighty duo of Rolls-Royce Avon turbojet engines, this monster of a fighter was thirsty for oxygen. They would provide a combined thrust of 6,500 pounds and get the fighter up to a conceivable Mark 1.5 at 47,500 feet. Totally unheard of for a fighter jet at the time, or even planes for that matter, that were still barely scraping by the sound barrier in steep dives. Struth. Now you'll notice that this nose cone is actually buried in the intake. A very strange design choice, but I'll get back to that in a minute. This cone would actually house the new advanced radar, specifically a video relay radar system, relayed from a ground station to the plane. So not an actual radar on board. This jet wouldn't be a Joey either, but more of a boxing kangaroo with its four half inch or 12.7 millimeter machine guns with 250 rounds per mounting. Perfect for going toe to toe in a dogfight with whatever the new enemy would throw at them. There was also plans for rudimentary rockets and bombs, but being 1949, the role of a fighter with simple guns was very much the beginning. With the concept sound, the engineers were given permission to move to phase two, wind tunnel tests. But this is where it all started to unravel. To ensure that the project was green lit, the engineers went all out. They produced dozens of mock-up models of various scales, from tiny versions made out of clay that could fit in your hand, to vast one-to-one -one scales for cockpit designs. So detailed were the schematics that the supervisors believed that it could be replicated entirely overseas at firms such as English Electric and Avro Canada. The British, who were visiting at the time in 1951, said that the company's project was the most ambitious design for a fighter and advances anything yet seen in any other part of the world. High praise indeed. For Australia, it seemed just like cricket, the game of bat and ball in the sky was theirs for the taking. But unfortunately, the plane was a victim of its own success. In 1951, a British mission to Australia, dubbed the Aircraft Development Mission of Design and Cooperation, restructured how the Air Force and this new aircraft would be managed in the overall empire. It would begin with a new British officer, Sir James Donald Hardman, who would fill the role of Chief of the Air Staff of the Royal Australian Air Force on the 14th of January 1952. Australia's Air Force would be led essentially from London. And part of his new role was acquiring new aircraft for the southern nation. And this new officer didn't exactly think very highly of his colonial counterparts. Hardman deemed that the aircraft design costs were too prohibitive, with an expenditure of £163,000 spent so far on the CA-23. He went on to add that advanced aeronautical research and design work should be centralised and resources pooled with Britain, in Britain. What a coincidence. All the new Australian aircraft wouldn't be designed from scratch and rather be British planes simply adapted to local conditions. In addition, he cited that the engineers had so far failed to incorporate the latest radar technology into the nose of the aircraft, something that would require a total redesign if this video relay system failed to eventuate. But it's this last point that's so damning for me. The UK Ministry of Supply very conveniently went beyond their scope of their department and produced a series of negative reports about the CA-23, reports that contained massively false assumptions and data comparisons to homegrown British aircraft. Some of the flaws they noted were that the principal criticisms related to the wing, the absence of aircraft interception radar, 
and the weakness of long intake ducts and jet pipes due to the low tail position. They also said that the very highly swept wing was too structurally expensive. And remember that last point because I'm going to circle back in a big way. The reports assumed that the aircraft wouldn't be able to operate in all weather conditions thanks to this video relay radar and based on existing failures of European counterparts, not actual testing. Lastly, with Australia being wooed by America to consider their new Sabre design, an alternative options were becoming increasingly tempting for the cash-strapped government. Members of the UK government, such as Sir Lawrence J. Wackett, ripped into the reports, but their voices were lost in the crowd. Alas, with Hardman's mind resolute and a quick stroke of his pen in early 1953, he moved the entire research done so far back to London and cancelled the CAC CA-23. But this story is about to take a turn for the worst because it seems that there were some Soviet rats in the British house. The spy game was alive and well by this point in 1953 and Stalin's minions were running rampant through various allied facilities. Everything from the US State Department, West Germany and of course the British Royal Aircraft Establishment. Remember all those detailed design documents that were spread far and wide across the empire? Well it's believed that Soviet spies, such as Wilfred Vernon, managed to get hold of them in transit and submit them back to the USSR. There, their engineers started to work on their own version of Delta Wing aircraft, producing a shockingly similar Su-7. Now this is tinfoil hat territory, as this link isn't exactly proven, but noting these similarities does make my blood boil. The British would also use the data to produce their own advanced jet fighters, such as the English Electric Lightning, but it would never see action in Australia. These planes are awfully similar to the CA-23, particularly two features of the design that were considered by many experts outside English Electric to be controversial. These were the very highly swept thin wing and the mounting of the tailplane at the bottom of the rear fuselage exactly the same items that the Ministry of Supply said were flaws on the CA-23 were championed on the English Electric. Something that the report never made the connection. So outraged by the cancellation of this fighter and subsequent damage to the indigenous aircraft design and production facilities that the next Australian Chief of Staff, John McCauley, would shift all new aircraft to their American counterparts, moving the country as a whole to preference an alliance with America over the United Kingdom. The next aircraft would in fact not be English, but North American F-86 Sabres. They would use those same Rolls-Royce Avon engines, but extensive redesigns would be required to make them fit all the requirements set by the Australian government, namely that range to fly between coastal cities. Redesigns that would only be possible with a team of crack engineers who had designed and worked on their own long-range fighter aircraft. Now, I'm going to take a step back from my homegrown passion and ask a question. Was this jet really as good as everybody claimed? Looking at the timeline, we can see that this aircraft still hadn't exited wind tunnel tests by 1953 and was only nearing the prototype stage. If given a few more years to enter active service, it would have been flying alongside US counterparts such as the F-104. Or maybe not. Now I'm going to backtrack a lot of what I've already mentioned in this video and look through the lens of a modern day skeptic. Eamon Hamilton, an aviation commentator, summed up the project perfectly. The CA-23 needed a lot of stars to align at home and both in the UK and US for it to ever become a reality. The lack of onboard radar, zero experience by the CISA building a fighter jet, and the fact that Australia was going up against England and the United States, who had unlimited money to spend on their own aircraft projects. In addition, I should mention that narratively, I did paint the English as a villain in this story, especially the guy who was the head of the Australian Air Force at the time. He was actually pretty pro-local industry, and he was commended after his service as being very pro-Australia. In fact, it was the Australian bureaucracy, modelled along the signs of the civil service, that was predominantly pro-British and wanted to follow orders. The structure of the government with subordination to the Crown ensured that the bureaucracy would not make any major decisions without reference to the United Kingdom. Essentially, it was Australians betraying Australians. 
Whilst the decision to cancel the CAC CA23 project was controversial at the time among the Australian political elite and aircraft industry insiders, it didn't end up doing any permanent damage. The Australian aviation industry has survived and we've proudly gone on to work on such innovative projects like the Boeing Project Wingman, a completely robotic fighter jet drone. It looks like the lads down at the airfield in the tin shed have once again invented the future and if you want to see more all about it, I've got a video right here. Much of this video research was done on the basis of the excellent work by Secret Projects and Dennis O'Brien who can read about it down below. Let me know in the comments what you think and if you agree that this story is bittersweet about Australia's revolutionary aircraft that was never built.